We're pleased to be joined today by executives of Naples Community Hospital. I'm Brent Batten with the Naples Daily News, and uh, they've asked me to moderate this session. Uh, part of the reason I suspect they asked me to moderate is because I've been doing something like this now for some weeks. When the uh, COVID story came across, it was obviously a very big story. There's a lot of information out there about it, and not necessarily all the information was authoritative. And the folks at uh, NCH Health Systems were good enough to volunteer to, to meet with uh, myself and some members of the editorial board every week. We had weekly discussions where they would update us on the status of what the hospital was doing and their strategies going, going forward and uh, the steps they'd taken up to this point to try to cope with this and make sure the system didn't get overwhelmed and make sure the, the community was well served by the hospital. Those uh, meetings proved to be very valuable to myself and to other members of the editorial board. So I, th I think the uh, people put their heads together and said, hey, what if we could bring that to the whole community? And, and let everybody have a chance to hear from these folks and, and to um, ask their questions. So that's what we've been planning to do. We we're able to do that today. I know the hospital is very interested in transparency in this matter. They want to get information out there. They want to get good, accurate information out there. Uh, one way to do it is to talk to the newspaper and the news media, of course. But another way to do it uh, is to talk to folks directly. So I'm glad to see we've got over 200 people right now joined in to, to listen to uh, Paul Hiltz and John Kling and talk to their, about their strategies and about what they're doing. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over. I believe, Paul, you're gonna start if you wanna uh, talk to folks and tell them a little bit about where we stand. I'm, I'm sure folks are uh, keenly interested in hearing from you. Well, Brent, thank you. And thanks so much for this opportunity. And, and thanks to the Naples Daily News and my kudos to you specifically and your team because I think you've done a great job of getting out good, timely information on a topic that can be very confusing, and you found a way to make it understandable, and I think it's been a real value to the community. So again, thanks so much. I'm joined by two really, really smart people. One of them, John Kling of the community, many of you know, is the chief nursing officer and also the chief operating officer for our North uh, Hospital. The, the other person that I'm joined with here is Dr. Kristen Muscati, and Dr. Muscati is in week two here as a chief medical officer for our health system. And we're really pleased to have Dr. Muscati here. She uh, was selected by a physician-led search committee after a nationwide search. She comes with great background in quality, and she's gonna speak to you in just a minute, but she also has a great background in this whole notion of epidemics and pandemics and is joining us at a, at a really critical time for our community. So my comments will be fairly brief and they will not be, uh, I'm not a physician, I, so I won't be speaking on the clinical things, but really speaking more as a leader of this region's biggest health system here in, in Naples. So, and one of the leading employers here too. A couple of people knowing about this had asked me, Paul, make sure you talk about capacity. The community's interested if a big surge happens, will you be prepared as a health system to take care of our community? The answer to that is yes, I'm thankful to say. Uh, back in January, we appointed a, uh, a COVID response team led by John Klang and one of our critical care doctors, Dr. David Lindner. And we asked John to come up with a way that we could dramatically increase our capacity. So we would start with 715 beds across the two hospitals. And we asked John to see how much we could add to that capacity. And he pretty quickly came up with his team a way where we could up the bed capacity to around 1,100 beds. And so that's available. Today in the two hospitals, we have 460 patients, so well below our capacity. The second piece you'll remember that you saw in national news was intensive care unit ICU bed capacity. We started with 49 beds originally. We've, uh, under John's uh, leadership with the medical community here, we've about tripled that capacity. So we've got plenty of ICU beds. And today in the ICU, we've got less than 40 patients in the ICU across both. The third thing you'll remember you heard on the news, Brent and others, was all this notion around ventilators. Will the country have enough ventilators? Well, we started off with somewhere around uh, 50, mid 50s in ventilators. We now have 165 ventilators available today. Uh, and I looked this morning, we had nine patients on a ventilator. So 
plenty of bed capacity, plenty of ICU capacity, plenty of ventilator capacity. And uh, working with the medical community here, we were able to get emergency credentialing for some retired doctors in the community. If we needed more medical physician manpower, we'd have that available. John has a, a, a nursing pool. So we think we would be in very good shape if in fact a surge hit. We don't see a scenario happening right now where we would be overwhelmed with patients. We believe we're ready to take care of the Naples community and still we're recommending all the things these two clinicians will talk about uh, related to social distancing, hand washing, and masks. Second piece I'd like to cover real quickly is people have said, Paul, is it safe to come to the hospital? And John will talk more about that as will Dr. Muscati, but it is very safe. Since the onset of the pandemic, uh, NCH has cared for well over 500 COVID patients. Uh, we've not had one patient cross-contaminated or infected by a COVID patient. So we've not had any patients infected by a COVID patient. John and his team uh, figured out a way pretty early on to put sort of a COVID hospital within a hospital. So we've segregated out all the COVID patients and put them in separate and distinct units at the north and the downtown. And we've done some additional things like figured out a way to have negative pressure rooms so that the air is sort of sucked back into the room to prevent aerosol, aerosolized particles from leaving the COVID wing. Uh, and that's been a big help. It's the opposite of what you would experience if you went up to an operating room, you'd feel the air blowing out to keep things out of the operating room. In this case, we're keeping all the germs, all of that inside the COVID unit. We also, thanks to the community support, have uh, purchased nine of these germ zapping robots. So these, uh, the latest technology in this infection control are these Xenex robots. Uh, nine of them that kills the coronavirus in the room in between patients, kills C. diff, kills MRSA. We've done a lot of other uh, cleaning and, and infection control uh, practices to keep these hospitals very safe. So I just emphasize to our community, don't put off emergent or acute care if you need it. It's safe. We've only had one patient or one staff member, excuse me, infected by a COVID patient since the beginning of this. And that person is recovered and doing fine. So we've done a great job of number one, preparing to be able to serve the community. Number two, keeping safe what we've got here. And I wanted to just kick it off with that. And now I'll turn it over to John Kling, who's done such a, such a great job. And, and I said yesterday to a group, I really believe that when this pandemic really tapers off, articles and case studies will be written about the work that this team has done to serve the community in a way that we can all be proud of. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Paul, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, share our story and some of the some key uh, talking points with you all. You know, Paul uh, hit on a lot of things here, and I really want to put my emphasis and focus on the safety of our organization and the, and the community's health. So Paul mentioned <laughs> zero um, employees that are currently quarantined uh, right now. We also have um, no employees since March 17th that have had a COVID-19 exposure. And to put that in perspective, I'm hearing, I got a question yesterday from a, a news report, reporter and said, John, if you could talk to Dr. or Governor DeSantis, what would you say about the opening? And I would say, you see what we're doing here, uh, social distancing when appropriate, masks when appropriate. I think it's really important that um, strict hand washing, all those smart things to do, it seems simple. But if we're going to uh, keep the second surge from happening, we're hearing a lot of things what about the second surge, all the positivity rates in Cuyahoga County, that's going to be important. And I base my comments on our outcomes and measurements here at the NCH healthcare system. And you talk about we have close to 5,000 employees and we've done close, we have 1,000 COVID-19 patients come through our healthcare system. And to have zero uh, patients get exposed to COVID-19 here, it, it speaks to the processes and policies we have in place 
that are really designed to protect our patients, protect our staff, uh, protect anybody in our healthcare system. Um, and I really want to uh, emphasize, please do not ignore your healthcare issues or concerns. I think it's really important that if you're having those signs and symptoms of heart issues or heart chest pain, stroke, elevated blood sugars, uh, many other things, um, please come into our, our hospitals. Uh, time is definitely precious with many, many of these um, uh, clinical abnormalities or diagnoses I'm talking about. And, you know, sometimes a little bit, it, it appears like we're kind of draconian some things, but it's been very good with our outcomes. Uh, we have done since day one, I remember Paul asked me back in January, he said, John, you know, we got to get in front of this. And this, this is what the day after the World Health Organization said, uh, declared this a global pandemic. Uh, Paul get, gave me a call and said, you know, what, what NSH has to be a community leader, we need to get ready. And that day kind of changed our lives and, and, and going forward. But we started planning that day and what are we gonna do for that projected surge? What's best practice? What, what can we do to leverage our affiliation and relationship with Mayo Clinic through the Mayo Clinic Care Network? Um, what testing devices are out there? What's FDA approved? And back in the beginning of this pandemic, there was many, many things that were out there from a testing perspective that weren't approved. Uh, and then you look at what's best practices with PPE, that's personal protective equipment, the masks, the gowns. And you heard on the news many, many times that you know, many organizations were out of PPE and we never got to that point. Uh, our team, I wanted to recognize them, we really focused hard on uh, preparing. And that's kind of the message that, you know, Paul talked about in the beginning. We are prepared. Uh, we are now in what we call a stabilization phase. I would say it's a, um, an ending phase because until there's a COVID uh, vaccine or medication that's uh, developed to treat COVID-19, um, you know, personal protective equipment, uh, mask around patient care, eye protection, the PCR, the nasal swab testing, will be you know, kind of a standard of care in healthcare systems. So we keep doing those things, keep being prepared. You know, Paul mentioned our capacity and I'm pretty proud of that. And um, we will be okay. And we will be here for our community and want you all to be assured that uh, we are ready to take care of anything and still continue to do the great care we've always done around heart and stroke and orthopedics, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit about um, our, you know, our safety campaign also was uh, focused on our employee health and we required all of our employees to do our COVID-19 antibody testing. So uh, I've been told that we're the first or one of the first large healthcare systems that has mandated antibody testing for their employees. Uh, we are sharing these results with uh, Mayo Clinic for their research trials and studies. The National Institute of Health has asked for our data because it's such a large cohort of, of study. We're, we're about 4,500 of our employees done. We're about a little bit over 90 percent, and we've had 43 patients or employees come back with uh, positive antibodies for COVID-19. Now, the antibodies I want to be real clear is a, a, a historical view of your viral history with COVID-19. Doesn't mean you're active with COVID-19. So, we're taking that information and saying, okay, of our 5,000 employees, 0.9 percent of our employees had COVID-19 or exposed to COVID-19 in the past and have antibodies developed. So we're taking that information uh, to understand what does immunity look like in the future? How will that help our researchers and scientists with COVID vaccinations? And how will that affect policies and procedures for healthcare systems across the country and around the world in protecting staff and patients from COVID-19? So uh, NCH has been involved with nine clinical trials and quality trials. So, your, your community healthcare system is really, really um, progressive and active in research around COVID-19. And our graduate medical education department has really been doing a lot of great work. So that 0.9% positivity rate for antibodies um, is, is remarkable when you think about the number of touches uh, we've had with patient COVID-19 positive patients. Um, and I think it lends to the fact that it's safe. Like, you know, it's like the fifth time I've said safe, I want you to understand that we have very safe processes and it's, it's much safer to come here than to ignore your health at home. So uh, one final statistic, and I'll pass over to Dr. Muscati, is that if you look at our positivity rate for antibodies at 0.9%, it 
in New York City was around 20 to 25 percent antibody positive rates. And in Northern Italy, where it was our hotspot at the beginning of this pandemic and globally, uh, their positive antibody rate was 15 to 18 percent. So again, the, our policies and processes around protective equipment is working, and we're, we're here for the community. I really wanted you all to hear that um, loud and clear. And going forward, the next week and the following weeks, we'll be doing our first responders for antibody testing. Um, I'll be working closely with the Cuyahoga County Public School District and the Cuyahoga County Government and the Sheriff's Office to offer our services. We're testing all of our volunteers. Uh, we're testing our diplomat uh, program, our, our diplomat in individuals. And our diplomats are, are people in the community that philanthropically support our mission and our community's well-being. So we thank them for that. And then we're going, you know, we have lots of, comp we're doing the neighborhood clinic as well next week for the antibody for their employees, and as well as um, spending a lot of time focusing on our medical resources, knowledge, product, protocols, and policies, as well as supplies to the Immokalee uh, uh, area. Uh, you know, one thing I'm sure we'll get questions on today, so I think I figured I'd hit that question. Um, we've donated hundreds of thousands of masks to uh, elementary schools, senior centers, um, Department of Health, and with the increased testing out in Cuyahoga County, we've asked, we've provided supplies for, uh, that are required for that. And also we're, we're a global response is, network is out there, it's a physician-led um, pandemic response unit that usually goes worldwide, but they're out in Cuyahoga right now. And also with um, uh, Doctors Without Borders as well. So we are, we are lending our knowledge, what we've learned from this, our supplies and resources to help that community. So with that being said, um, I'll turn over to Dr. Muscati to talk about her background and role. Sure. Well, first I'd like to say hello and thank the team for the warm welcome that uh, we received here in, in Naples. And so just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Minnesota, born and raised there through college and over to Wisconsin um, as well, medical school at the University of Minnesota. So I know there are a lot of Midwesterners out there. So uh, hello. I spent uh, time as the Vice President of Clinical Quality at the University of Minnesota and Really within my first 90 days, we had the Ebola pandemic, and that was a large initiative for the state. We had a lot of um, immigrants to our area that put us at risk. So the governor had asked us along with the state to really develop a special containment, containment um, unit so that we could be ready for the state of Minnesota as well as the entire five state region. So that was a great way to meet the whole team at the University of Minnesota and the chief nurse at the time and myself led that initiative. So uh, much of the COVID response that we're dealing with here feels very much like what we were dealing with in the early times of the preparing for the Ebola pandemic. So um, did go back out to California as, as Paul said, served as the chief quality officer there for patient safety. So that really is my passion as well as quality and so much of what the team has talked about are things that I absolutely am um, here to help with. Uh, I'm now here as the Chief Medical Officer of the system, so it's a little bit about my background. I did have the fortunate experience to work with the team a little bit during the transition to compare how are, how are we doing this as a nation, collaborate with the University of Minnesota as well as California, and here in terms of how we're responding to this pandemic. And I can tell you from an external perspective, this team has done a phenomenal job. And I, I, you don't need to take my word, we actually have significant data to prove that data that would be envied by much of the nation, not only in terms of our, our employees who've been uh, not exposed, how we protected them, as well as no patient to patient transfer. So these are all um, things that are really, the, the data supports this and the hospital within the hospital system, the organization and processes behind that is what should make us feel safe to come back to the hospital when we need to. So I, I got a chance to work with the team a couple of key points just coming from the outside looking in that honestly would be quite envied by many in the nation were um, this community and this hospital's ability to do testing. Um, it was very difficult in the early parts of this to be able to do this well and accurate and NCH uh, had one of the first antibody testing machines to do large scale. So the ability to do research and bring this out to the nation is such a bright spot for us and really something to be proud of. 
Um, not many can um, say we've tested all of our employees to look for this spe specific antibody to see if we've been exposed to it before. And then to see that our rates are so low, I think uh, are encouraging in terms of how we've done for the personal protective equipment. So that's something definitely to be envied. I think the second thing to be envied is really the community response and what we've seen, how the community has come together, not only for Immokalee, but some of our affiliations with Mayo Clinic in terms of the therapies we could provide quickly to patients. So uh, those were a few things that I think we should be very, very proud of and I'm excited to join as a team member here because of all the great work that's being done. So I'm happy to take questions from the group and any other comments. So Brent, just, want, just to put a, a period on that one, um, what's amazing coming into this community as it relates to this response, so much of what we just talked about was driven by the community. So the Zenex robots were donated, all nine of them. Uh, significant sort of anonymous donors came in to, to help fund the antibody testing machine. We've had thousands of meals delivered to our frontline workers. The chamber here, which is one of the top chambers in the United States, the business community has rallied behind NCH. So I love the fact, and of course, Naples Daily News, what you've been able to do to help with the communication and reporting of it. It's truly a community effort, and I think in the end, we're all going to benefit greatly from that. All right. Well, we've got uh, quite a few questions uh, coming in here. If you, don't, if you guys don't mind, we'll start uh, getting on some of those. See, we've got 301 participants, by the way, which is a, a great number for something like this. So you guys really are reaching out. Uh, reaching a, a lot of the community here. Let me uh, click on some questions. Uh, many of these are coming in uh, from anonymous uh, uh, viewers, so I won't, I won't try to read the names, but uh, one attendee asks, if someone tests positive for COVID-19 and then tests negative a few days later, do they still need to self-quarantine or can they assume that the virus has dissipated? So the question is, if someone tests positive for COVID-19 and then they test negative, they have to test again. I'll answer the question from what the CD says around patients. Um, we do require uh, two negative tests 24 hours apart for us to be able to transfer a patient out of our healthcare system to a long-term care facility. Um, but for home, uh, one, one negative and we ask them to follow up with that. So I think it's, um, there's two variables. One, if you're going from a hospital uh, scenario to a long-term care facility, there's additional stringent requirements around that versus going to home and uh, being isolated while you still recover from home or are recovered at home. Hope that answered that question. Okay. Um, next up, an attendee asks, my wife and I, for the most part, have been staying home except for going to the grocery and doctor. We wear masks when out and have no symptoms and are feeling well. Is there a need for us to get tested? No, I, you know, I'll answer that question, Dr. Scott. You can, there is no need to get tested. You know, as we still are understanding this virus, um, I think you're doing the right thing with wearing your mask and social distancing as much as possible and the good hand washing. Uh, with the limited reserves and testing, we, we, we want to reserve those for the uh, symptomatic uh, patients or peoples or people that have had known exposure to a positive patient through their family or somewhere else. So I'll defer to Dr. Muscati for anything additional. I, I agree. Things that I try to tell uh, friends and family and, and everyone is, is really the hand hygiene. Literally, if you can try to carry some of the hand sanitizer with you in the car, after the grocery store, really everywhere you go, I think that's your best protection and agree with the, the masks and and, and some of the isolation, again, depending on um, some of your underlying disease um, situations. But, but earnestly, we do want people to come to the hospital. I think that's the other message that I definitely want to re-articulate. As been said, we can't put off um, our issues that need to be seen and dealt with timely because it, it's safe to come to the hospital and, and putting that off can be very, very difficult. Another question. I've been wiping down my mail, packages, and groceries before I put them away. In light of new reports saying that this is less likely to catch COVID-19 from surfaces, is all of this still necessary? So 
look at the CDC recommendations, and you know, I think I said a long time ago with um, a wink interview in March, uh, facts, not fear, should drive our decisions. So uh, you, you've heard us said a few times here, hand strict, you know, good hand hygiene, hand sanitizer if you don't have a sink, social distancing, that's what we should focus on. Going above and beyond is not gonna hurt you, but it's not really what the uh, CDC and the literature are saying is required to help prevent COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that we're learning as well is we're all new to wearing these masks. And I, I think one thing that we've identified is we all touch our face so much more than we actually know. So beside hand hygiene, one other practical thing we can do is not touch our face as much and be sure again with the hand washing. Speaking of, speaking of masks, uh, an attendee asks, they say to wear a mask, but does it have to be an N95 mask to be efficient? And then as a follow-up, the same person asks, are you allowing visitors in the hospital? I'll start with the mask and we take it off because it's very hard to hear us speak on this without it. And as we're not, with the, with the, we're in the six feet apart, it is best practice to wear a mask. Also, if you look at um, the mask, the surgical mask we're wearing now, that is a mask that is uh, worn primarily outside of a patient care area. If you're doing an aerosolized generating procedure, which basically that means particles from your lungs can come out, the N95 mask and eye protection is required in our healthcare system. Um, you know, we as healthcare leaders want to demonstrate the right things to do, and this call is no different from that. So we were taking turns speaking and we were a mask to, so that you all can hear us better and still, you know, follow our processes. The visit out. I want to answer to that, or are you good? Okay. So then in the, our visitation policy, I'll, I'll just wait for that question to come up. And, you know, I got a lot of questions that when Lead Health opened up their visitation policy, not fully, but to, to an extent. And with the recent outbreak and, posit, and, and elevation of positivity rates in Immokalee and Golden Gate City, and the overall positive rate in Collier County, you now this, this changes daily, it's about 11 and a half percent. You compare that to Lee County, three and a half percent, it's much higher here. Um, and then if you compare the us as well to Miami-Dade County, another hotspot of 9.8%, uh, we have one of the higher positivity rates. Now that has not correlated to increased hospital emissions or critical care emissions or mortalities as Paul mentioned at the very beginning. We're actually, we've seen about a 10 patient decrease over the past two weeks on average um, in COVID-19 patient healthcare system. But because of the increased positive uh, rates in the community, uh, NSAGE from day one has really taken a, um, a cautious standpoint and we've used an abundance of caution in all our decisions and whatever the CDC or Department of Health recommends, we follow that to letter and most times we go above and beyond. So we are looking daily at the uh, positive rates in Cuyahoga County and we do have a, vis a compassionate visitor policy since day one. So, if, and every director of all of our departments has the ability to make that decision. So if there is an end of life scenario or a, a child's in there and their parents need to be with them or the patient can't make decisions on their own for mental capacity status, we do allow that and we have allowed that since day one. So, um, but we know that families are large, are very important to our patients. You all are important to us as an organization. And when we feel like it's safe, we will open the visitation going forward. It may look different than it did prior to COVID, but we are focused on that. A lot of people are wondering about masks and have a lot of questions about masks. Here's one. If you do the six foot social distancing, is a mask necessary in a large room? So if you look at what the CDC recommendations are, if you can remain six feet apart from people, even in a large social gathering and maintain that, the key word there is maintain that, and you have a comfort level that the people in the room are not gonna, are gonna also follow those practices. There's no reason why you have to wear a mask per the guidelines. However, um, I would recommend, this is John Kling's personal opinion, that if you are with them in a large area and you can't guarantee that you could not come within six feet, I would wear it, you know. Safer, why be safer than sorry, right? Or better to be safer than sorry, excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're in Naples, Florida, so I guess this question was bound to come up. When sharing a golf cart, should I be wearing a mask? 
<laughs> Depends on how you're playing that day, I think. <laughs> I'm playing with you, uh, we, can, we can talk about now. Um, a lot of the golf courses I know are requiring only individual riders for a golf cart, but I would wear a mask and follow the guidelines. I think sometimes uh, with large gatherings, what we're finding is we, we start out with the social distancing, but then as people are more comfortable, just by human nature, we aggregate a little bit closer. So um, at least wearing the mask is would protect against that. Okay. I know you guys uh, have touched on this already, but uh, perhaps uh, for, for our readers' benefits, you could uh, elaborate. What precautions are taken for people coming in for elective surgery? Okay. So um, what precautions are being taken from our elective cases? So we are testing all elective cases that are aerosolized during procedures, and actually all cases. So we have a pre-event testing protocol uh, that we do for any planned surgeries. If it's an elective case that can't be done three to four days prior for testing, we use in-house testing for all cases. And as Paul mentioned, we kind of have a hospital within the hospital, so we don't place patients in any non-COVID care areas that, uh, because prior to a bed placement, we get the test back. So there's, that's why we have a zero patient-to-patient -patient infection um, statistic that's very important. So we are testing all patients prior, and that is the best, best practice, and it protects you, it protects the surgeons, and our staff, so we're following the best practice guidelines. What percentage of positives are being hospitalized? Okay, so um, NCH healthcare system has tested a little bit over 11,000 patients since it started, and that, that includes through our drive-throughs, um, our EDs, our urgent cares, inpatient testing, and of that testing, 11% of, of, of those results have required hospitalization, which is based on the national norm, a little bit below the national norm. Of that 11% admission rate, um, only 20% of that 11% is requiring critical care admission, which is significantly below the national norm. Um, so we, we discharge on average about five to seven COVID-19 patients home a day. And uh, so I'm pretty proud of that. Maybe just one more thing to add about testing and, and bring it back to the community is not only are we looking at the testing that we've done here with our employees, we also have provided kits so that we can um, test the first responders, the police departments, the fire departments, and, and I think we'll have to look at how, how those results come up. And again, it's probably an area for a national publication to look at how our employee pool, which are first responders and are directly with patients and then some of the first responders in the community, what did their rates look like? So just another um, piece for the community about how we're doing testing and that we have the ability to do here because of this um, instrumentation. Okay. How can people in Immokalee protect themselves? Many are farm workers and live in crowded areas so they cannot isolate or social distance at home. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, it's a great question and, and one we've been working on for months now, or weeks and months. I think what we've said already, we continue to repeat that. Uh, Dr. Carlos Quintero is one of our um, practicing hospitalists and, the, and uh, a leader in our physician group. He's also our uh, chief quality officer with Dr. Muscati. He works very closely with Dr. Muscati, uh, also Spanish speaking. So he's done a lot of education, a lot of PSAs, um, radio shows about in Spanish about what we can do. We've, we've um, created medical protocols in English, Spanish, and Creole to, to pass out there. We work very closely with the Department of Health and also with the, through our chamber and Michael and I'll be in the chamber, uh, work with them on it, kind of going back to work kits that has information about testing and hand hygiene and and medical services, and we've offered our virtual telemedicine platform for free. So if, if they don't have access to come down to, into our facilities in um, Western Cuyahoga County, they can use our uh, physician services virtually for free to help them, and then donated iPads and all kinds of resources. So uh, we can always do more, and, and I think now that, and we've also, one more thing I think is important that our 
Dr. Linder that uh, Paul Hills had mentioned is our medical director for COVID, also our pulmonary critical care chair of that department that has had multiple meetings with the Florida Surgeon General and kind of brainstorming of how they're testing and caring for that, those, those, that community specifically, as well as all of Carter County. So many, many things that we can do to continue to help that patient uh, population health out there. John, I believe too, we've been in touch with the county commissioner, with the elected officials, as well as donated PPE to the area. Am I right about that? Correct. Yeah, so uh, we've, we've donated, I think, close to 100,000 masks to the Guadalupe Center. Horizon House actually is a, is a shelter in place up there in that area. Uh, we've worked with local um, hotels to have those people that are, who are positive COVID be able to stay in those hotels for free. So they don't expose the family members. There's been one of the opportunities in my is there's a um, very densely packed population and some of the families have quite a few people in small areas. So if, them, if they're, we can identify the positive patients or, employ, or people, excuse me, not patients, and kind of isolate them and still care for them, then it, it protects those other family members in that same house. So that's a big focus on resources to keep them isolated, but yet still feel safe. Right. I think one of the things that we're learning, particularly about Immokalee and, and what Dr. Quintero has been uh, sharing with us, is, is basically it also is an issue of trust as well as, as myth versus fact understanding what uh, can protect you during the pandemic in terms of the mask use and hygiene. And so having um, Doctors Without Borders who has significant experience dealing with this type of situation where we really have to develop trust with the individuals there, um, I think that is the best method and, and that has shown effect as opposed to um, some of the other things that have been done there with uh, looking at how we can best serve that community. Well, we'll continue with the, the subject of Immokalee then when an attendee asks, why was it necessary for MSF to come into Immokalee? Why hasn't NCH led rather than just support or lend resources? The effort to provide testing and care in Immokalee rather than pulling resources and personnel from a non-government organization that usually operates in refugee slash war zones. I, I can try to answer some of that. I think it does actually go back to the trust issue. Some of these individuals are, are actually, we've been told, very scared to approach when it is a federal agency. And so based on the community needs is why I think they took the approach with the um, non-governmental and that's been much better received by the community. So uh, that I think has been a, a better approach. To right. And I think, and the question about why is the state not leading this, we are leading a collaborative in Cuyahoga <laughs> County, and that includes uh, organizations such as Arthrex, Physicians Regional Medical Center, NCH, other uh, large organizations. We are all in this coalition, so to speak, uh, donating our supplies and expertise where applicable to, to support those non-governmental agencies, as well as support the Department of Health um, in that in that area we're here for everybody and, and whatever we've been asked we've stepped up and done to my knowledge wrapping up perhaps with immokalee where are the positives that are from immokalee being hospitalized when necessary so um they I, I, for a factor they're, they're in nsh healthcare system hospitals and their physicians regional i, I talk to physician regional every day to their leader their medical leadership and one of the Benefits that if there was one that came out of COVID-19 was the improved collaboration with Lee Health and with Physician Regional. Uh, this was a, a global population health issue that was bigger than NCH, that was bigger than physicians, that was bigger than Lee. And I think we realized really early on that that collaboration was going to be key. And we had that initiative stronger together, now it's safer together, the hashtag stronger, hashtag safer together with Lee Health. And I think that is the key, I think, that we don't have to be the leader. We are the leader, but with our resources and knowledge, uh, we can share and help other people become uh, a resource for our community as well. And we're a better, we'll be a better county for it. The panelist wants to know, does NCH have adequate remdesivir and convalescent plasma for patients in Collier County? So um, again, a shout out to Dr. Linder. He worked very, very hard 
in the beginning uh, from remdesivir is the medication. Now that's a study drug that's showing promise. However, it's still a study drug uh, for the treatment of COVID-19. And we are one of the primary um, designation points for the, the uh, Florida Department of Health. They are controlling the remdesivir um, par level of the drug and they are distributing it to hospitals in the state of Florida uh, based on strict criteria. So we have probably, I was told by our pharmacy director, we have one of the largest allocations of the drug in, our, in the state of Florida based on our patient numbers. And uh, we are submitting all of that data. We're in the Gilead remdesivir trial, clinical trial that uh, we talked about one of our Naples Daily News editorial posts probably two months ago uh, on all of their studies we're doing. So we really do have uh, a good supply of that. The other question was the uh, convalescent plasma exchange protocol. Uh, that's a, a trial that the Mayo Clinic uh, started back in the very beginning of this pandemic. They reached out to us as part of the Mayo Clinic Care Network and said, are you interested in doing that? And I think actually we reached out first with Dr. Linder's uh, Motive, you know, uh, motivation to, to kind of take the next step and be research-based and, and help the understanding of this virus. And we had patient number 300 on this, con on this trial that has over 10,000 patients in the trial now. And really essentially what it does is it takes a recovered COVID-19 positive patient that is now 28 days negative and they donate their plasma at our blood, our blood center. And the, the hypothesis or theory is that we're studying is that those, that plasma is now being transfused into a current active COVID-19 patient in the hospital. The antibodies in that plasma will help that patient recover quicker and reduce mortality rates. So we're, that, all that data, we've done 55 of those patients so far, which is a pretty good number for a healthcare system of our size in so this trial. And we've shared that data with um, Mayo Clinic and they're collating the data now and looking forward to what that study shows. And I just add one thing to that, John, as a non-doctor, I think one thing the community would be kind of impressed with, we've had on site here a couple of times over the past few months, some of the, the leading thinkers in the world, really, from the Mayo Clinic's Infectious Disease Division here, speaking with our doctors or telephonically. Uh, the other piece is I believe that after this is all said and done, we'll find that health systems that, that had 24-7 intensivist coverage, so doctors that specialize in intensive care medicine, which we have here, which a lot of health systems in America don't have. We're fortunate with Dr. Lindner, Harrington, and their teams. I believe that's going to be correlated with increased survival rates of COVID patients. Uh, just a couple other points that I think I'd add to the entire conversation relating to uh, the community, it, it's not only how the, this hospital network comes together with the local community, that's where we have to reach out at the state level so that we can look at where are we having our um, areas of increased activity and that's a state response and then even broader nationally with best practices and teaming with Mayo Clinic, that's really how we get our arms around these pandemic situations and you can see everything that we have talked about today really highlights not only the system level and what we're doing in the hospital to make things safe, but within the community, partnering with the state to look at the areas that have increased activity and getting the appropriate allocations for treatment. And that through the state collaboration is why we have some of the, the medication stocks that we have. So it really is a collaboration of all, sort of akin to what we did during the pandemic or the, the not pandemic, the outbreak of, um, of Ebola at the University of Minnesota, when, when the systems come together at the local, state, and then federal level, that's when things actually uh, go better. I'm seeing some questions uh, coming up about the curve and the spike and uh, those sorts of issues. So maybe you could address a couple of those. When was the greatest use of hospital facilities? Are we beyond the spike? A spike. <laughs> so, you know, the curve and the spikes, that, in the beginning, and from March until about May 4th, we had an average about 34, 35 patients that were COVID positive in our healthcare system. May 4th on the first phase of the reopening, we saw an increase to the mid 50s um, for the last four, for, the, for about four weeks. Um, and we still saw about a 50% bed capacity during all that time. So we never get even close to 
uh, meaning capacity in our healthcare system for, to accept patients. And actually the last week, our, our number this morning, we have 46 COVID-19 patients and we were down to 44. So we dropped about 10 patients a day on average in this last week, even with all the openings. So again, social distancing, hand washing, hand sanitizing, doing what we can, uh, we'll keep that next surge that people keep talking about, I hear, uh, at bay. Um, so we're not really seeing a spike or a surge or almost like a leveling off. So that's why we're, I mentioned that we're into the stabilization phase and, and from an NCH healthcare system perspective is how can we keep this stable? How can we tamp it out or reduce the impact of, of any possible exposures to our staff and our community so that we have the capacity to safely care for you all, which we do today. Okay. Along those lines, do you think there will be a second wave in the fall? Yeah, it's hard. We can't speculate on that. What we can speculate on or and talk about is that if we do the right things, what we've seen historically is that that has had a positive impact on reducing the surge. So let's do the right thing and then so we don't have to talk about a surge in the fall. I, I would say one thing from very early on, the concerns of the surge as well as how many were not only hospitalized, but how many needed critical care and then how many have needed ventilations. I think we've evolved in that information and that's looking much more optimistic than we originally thought. I think also looking at all of the different um, ways we're treating this illness has been very, very helpful. And I can tell you that the, the leaders here have done a, a fantastic job in terms of keeping up on the latest technologies and, and treatments as we've sort of discussed. So I think that is uh, uh, cautiously optimistic. Second wave, I don't think we can predict, but say that we're um, ready for it. And, and Dr. Miscotti, can I ask you, when a patient is hospitalized for COVID, uh, how long do they typically stay with us? So I, I think that varies depending on sort of the underlying condition and the age of the patient. And when we have the ventilation rates, as, as John has discussed, that could sometimes be a little longer. I will tell you that it seems to be shifting a little bit from some of what we were seeing um, in California in terms of length of stay. So it, it depends on underlying conditions and age, but then secondarily, um, it also is making sure we can place them in the appropriate place when they go home or if they go to a, a nursing facility. Obviously those places have been very, very careful as are we in terms of patient placement and requiring the two negative tests so they can stay for a while. I think that what's so important to look at is not only who's in the hospital, how many are being tested, but it's really that use of critical care as well as ventilation that makes the difference. Thank you. And, and along the same lines, a reader wants to know, Dr. Fauci wanted to flatten the curve and we did so, but the area under the curve is still the area under the curve. Is it a foregone conclusion that if you're destined to get COVID, then so be it? Do you believe that we will all ultimately be exposed and get the bug? Yeah, you can take that one. That's a hard one. That's a tough one. Yeah. That's a pretty good question. Um, I, I don't think that anybody is destined to get COVID-19. I think we do have, there are some variables that we cannot control. However, there are many variables that we can, and that's really, um, if we want to flatten the curve and, and get below that curve, as you mentioned, if we do that, I think we'll be very successful. However, um, you know, there's nothing, nothing is a, is a given or a sure thing. And it, it, I would say if you're a person, the literature, the data has shown, if you're um, an L 65 or older and you have pre-existing conditions, chronic conditions, you are at more risk. So there are some recommendations around things that can reduce that risk. However, um, we are a very mobile society. And I think if you are out and about the hand washing, the mask and the is gonna be a very good uh, thing to keep you as safe as possible. I, I might just add, first of all, I, I love the reference to math and back to high school math <laughs> for that question. But when we look at the area under the curve, we also have to understand the curve itself is different. At the beginning, um, literally there were times where we were limited um, in parts of the nation to not very many tests a day. So our testing capacity was much reduced now the curve is also changing in terms of availability to tests. 
So it's not only that the curve is changing, the area under the curve is, and I go back to the previous points about looking at how many are admitted as well as how many require the critical care utilization and ventilation. So we've actually shown better numbers there. That I think is the encouraging point. Regard to data and testing and everything we see in the newspapers and elsewhere, this is very difficult to interpret in terms of when we had testing availability, who we were testing, how we were counting mortality. So that's um, a whole nother topic. But um, when we look at the data, we need to follow some of the, the biggest parameters, the big targets, which are really how many do we have, how are people doing, and how are we able to treat, and what are our capacities. Okay. Um, I know some of these fall outside your purview, but I'll combine a couple questions here and perhaps you can weigh in. Uh, an attendee points, I know some restaurants are not following capacity guidelines. How can that better be enforced? I also know some restaurant employees are not following mask guidelines. How can that be better enforced? And then finally, would you suggest avoiding restaurants if their employees do not wear masks? Good. Yeah, yeah I, that is, a, again, a, a pop health initiative. And always it's good if, you're in, if you see that and you have ability to communicate with that restaurant owner to have that conversation. The Department of Health is there to, to help address these issues. Um, if you wanted to contact us with that information, we'd be happy to communicate with the Department of Health and with the Chamber as well and see what we can do to help educate. Maybe it's a resource. Maybe they don't have the ability to get masks and we can be a partner and help facilitate uh, protective, personal protective equipment. Um, that's a personal decision that each person has to make. And as, if you assume that risk of going to an organization that's not following the protocols, that's something that each person has to decide for themselves. Um, I personally probably would not go there. However, um, that's something that's tough for me to answer from a definitive standpoint, but we're here to help facilitate conversation and resources and testing if necessary for these restaurants. We want to be a part of, partner in the community. Uh, keeping with the theme of things that are probably outside your direct purview, uh, a reader wants to know, any thoughts on the schools reopening in August? Good one. Yes, I have three kids in yes. school, and so um, <laughs> uh, we are working very closely with the Cary County Public School, and they've been wonderful um, on their protocols. Some, a few of our physician leaders have actually sat on their um, their committees that are bringing in the experts and talking about what's it going to look like in the school year. Uh, I think. Um, we're going to see you know, a lot can change by August, but also. Um, it was, as we know, so much more now than we did back in March. So as we learn more about this and the, the population health impacts, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I can tell you that our physician leadership in the Department of Health and the, and the um, CDC is working very closely with the Cary County Public School District to do what's right for our children. Looking forward to seeing what they come up with for my children, too. Sure. I think the other point that I'd add is this information is different in the pediatric population in terms of the data and how it's affected them. So. We need to look at that, but of course they have adults around them and serving them, and we have the, the teachers, but um, it, it has been a more, obviously, an older um, patient in terms of being at risk. The, the pediatric population and the young, again, they could be the asymptomatic carriers, but it's an entirely different demographic. Um, keeping at the theme of age, according to your st statistics, what is the, what is the age and health condition, heart problems, diabetes, et cetera, of the majority of patients that have been hospitalized? So, Brent, can you repeat the last part of it again? Chronic condition. The, the, the attendee wants to know the age and the, and the general health condition of the, the patients that you've hospitalized, mentioning specifically heart problems and diabetes. Yeah, so at NCH Healthcare System, we've seen patients from six months old to 101 years old that were positive for COVID-19. The median age in March was uh, 68. Now it's 52. Uh, really, the, the primary the primary diagnosis is acute pulmonary issues like asthma, COPD, respiratory distress syndrome. Those pulmonary precursors were seeing were are, we're seeing a little bit higher positivity rates. We've also seen. Uh, 
probably about 25% of our patients with a significant cardiac history, uh, atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, diabetes is, a very, is also a, a large one, and then kind of a smattering of other things, and some very asymptomatic patients that did present at all clear chest x-rays that were positive. So um, it's been a little bit of an enigma, but that's, that is NCH's kind of statistical view to date. Right, and, and I would say in general, it, it, it mimics what we're seeing across the country. It, it is a, an age group in general that can have higher risk, not only from age, but that chronic conditions seem to be, um, the comorbidities as we call them, seem to be um, a, a significant risk factor with this one. Um, keeping with the theme of age, an article in today's paper suggested that the recent surge in positive cases here in Florida is younger people going to bars since the reopening. Does the data here in Collier County support this conclusion? Um, I can't answer that question. I don't, I don't know the, the latest statistics in Collier County. I have to look at the Department of Health. But what we have seen nationally and locally is that uh, the younger population are the asymptomatic carriers and that's where when you're out in public if young people don't know they're sick and if you're an elderly person with chronic issues that's where it's smart to wear the mask because you just don't know who you're going to be around um, i can't comment on the whole bar scenario but um, I, i've seen those reports as well but we're watching very closely with what the reopening phases are doing to our our uh, infection rates but most importantly to dr Muscati's point What's that, what, is that correlated to hospital admissions and critical care admissions or not? So that's something we watch every day. <laughs> um, it's, we're well into June now, so it's appropriate to ask what special preparations are being made in the event we have a hurricane coming our way? <laughs> so uh, we have updated our hurricane policy and I've been here in Collier County for 17 years. I've been through several and we were, uh, I was here during Irma and uh, we are, as for, let me just say, NCH is not a shelter. So um, and with social distancing, we cannot be a shelter and, and safely care for our patients and keep the visitors and our employees safe. So we did redo all of our hurricane pandemic and surge policies uh, prior to hurricane season starting. And, and we, we have re, redone our protocols around management during a hurricane. So hopefully we won't have to enact that, but we're, we're prepared. Uh, a couple of questions on the, the financial front. Is hospitalization for COVID-19 fully covered by Medicare Advantage programs? I, I think COVID admissions are being covered by Medicare, traditional Medicare, any Medicare Advantage program or any commercial insurance. It's a legitimate diagnosis. It'll be, if you're covered, you'll be covered for uh, COVID. Okay. And Paul, uh, on, along the financial front again, did NCH receive any federal assistance or grants to help minimize losses caused by the pandemic? If so, how much and how are the funds being applied in your budget? Yeah, the answer is yes. We uh, received two sources of funds. One was the, the PPP um, funds that, that will not have to be paid back. That number was in the $18 million range. Uh, there was another set of funds that were advanced pay, uh, just advanced payments that will have to be paid back and will be reconciled with our Medicare fee for service. So the 18 million will be very helpful because we are projecting a, an operating loss this year of somewhere in the $45 million range. So the 18 will help, but it won't solve the whole issue. Uh, having said that, we do think that we're in much better shape than many other health systems in America. We've got a very solid balance sheet and we believe that if we can, you know, get we will get through these next few months, but we believe we can get back on track next year uh, without a ton more financial damage to our system. Okay. And we're running out of time. I think we'll probably have to make this the uh, last question. I know our uh, participants have uh, other things to attend to over there at NCH, but uh, it's, it's an important question and one looking forward. What role is NCH going to play going forward in testing for the virus, antibodies, and contact tracing? So uh, going forward, I mentioned a little bit of my initial openings talk that uh, we have already partnered and donated thousands of test kits for our first responders. 
Um, they, they, we also ask them, and they will, which we're excited about, will participate in our research study uh, with those results for frontline uh, first responders. Um, you know, we are moving on to the next phase of community testing for antibodies, and we're working with all of our community physicians on protocols for doing the nasal swabbing in offices. As, as we've now learned more about that, it is, it is safe to do nasal swabs in physician offices with the proper PPE and proper facilities, which is not too hard. So going forward, we'll continue to offer the antibody testing. We're working with uh, several companies on a going back to work kit that would include nasal swabbing, antibody testing, and education, and or virtual medicine uh, package, so to speak, to kind of give a, a soup to nuts kind of a portfolio or a package that the employers could offer those to their uh, employees or new hires coming on to ensure safety for their customers and each other. And I think our goal really was, we said back in with the Naples Daily News back in March, that we want to test all of the workers in Cairo County, that's about 120,000 or so employees. And then as this continues to progress, we will share our data. And our data, I believe, will be a very strong um, impact on the understanding of the virus that wants to help us understand uh, health policies going forward. We'll share that with the Department of Health. And then, and most importantly, the scientific community can help understand what our, our numbers show when they look at a vaccine and our treatment going forward. So, Scotty, no, I, I agree. I think it's going to be fascinating, like I said, to look at the first responders in the community compared to the, our employees in terms of uh, the, the positivity rate. So looking forward to some of that information and, and the ability for those families and individuals to know and understand as well. So exciting. Brent, as we wrap up, I know we've had a lot of our friends on, on the call today, uh, the Community Foundation and others, and we just wanted to say thank you to this wonderful community uh, for, for all that, that you've done to make this possible. And Brent, thanks to you and Naples Daily News. All right. Thank you. I see we're out of our appointed time. Uh, thank you to all the attendees for your great questions, and thank you guys for your uh, uh, willingness to sit and uh, answer questions and share your insights. I believe we're done here. So just so you know, there's on the Q&A, they'll be on the website as well, correct? So okay. there were lots of questions we were able to get to, but we'll look at that and get them answered on the website. Great. Folks can look for that. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.